Right. We all, we all. Sussex students who I haven't had a chance to meet and the students from Brighton Journalism Works and particularly to our guests I was, always include Paul um, Mike Gilson Tim Ridgway, Greg Hadfield who will be into talking later the structure of the evening is this, it's an unusual event, I should tell you we're on what's called lecture capture so it means everything down here is being recorded um, so if I suppose you could race to the front and get your face on, but the lecture capture does not extend to the audience. Um, we're going to ask Paul, who's been one of Britain's most distinguished investigative journalists for a long time, who has come over to the other side, so to speak, and is going to be um, is a senior lecturer here. He's going to talk about what is investigative journalism and why is it different from other forms of journalism. Um, can we get a seat there, Paula? Um, and then... Um, There'll be a brief Q&A with Paul about investigative journalism. And then, I'm going to inv and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Paula from Brighton Journalism Works, who will take look after the second half. She will introduce... The, sp the speakers will speak in turn about the local media here in Brighton and particularly how you can get involved. We will see if there are any big questions that people are burning to answer, but I'm actually hoping that we can adjourn to the IDS bar, that's the, Inst the Institute for Development Studies, which is next door, where they have a bar, and I thought hopefully we could, you, it will give you the opportunity, I hope, to engage more informally with our, our guests, and if you've got any thoughts you want to pitch to them, ideas, it might be better. So we'll have a brief Q&A, but hopefully we'll end up in the bar, I hope, um, which does serve soft drinks, I should say. Um, it's open to 10.30, but we might not be there that long. So, without further ado, I'm going to ask my um, colleague and friend Paul to talk um, about investigative journalism and then hand over to Paula. Thanks. Right, so um, I think some of you would have seen me earlier because I gave, uh, I was working with my academic hat on earlier and I was a little more um, serious. Uh, in this circumstances I think we can be a little more um, light-hearted about what we're going to do. Uh, before I start, I mean I'm really impressed by the turnout uh, for a start. I'm really interested to know Who's here exactly? So, um, could I have um, the, the, those who are doing journalism at Sussex put their hand up? Undergraduate and postgraduate. And both, yeah, both go. And how many are with BJW separately? Oh, good. That's a good turnout. Excellent. Uh, and other Sussex students who happen to walk in by mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Media comp. No, right. No. Well, that's all good. That's great. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to indoctrinate you in the mysterious arts of investigative journalism as such. Right, that's me. I'll move on a bit. Um, the first thing I want to do is, like, I'm, I'm going to talk about investigative journalism, and this, is, this, this does tend to get associated with older journalists, journalists like myself who have got grey hair, uh, male and female. Uh, but um, what I would say is that there's a real important caveat here. Journal investigative journalism is, does require some experience, often. Uh, it does require knowledge of the law. It, it needs a certain approach to journalism. It is a state of mind. But it doesn't belong to the over 40s. Um, surprising as it may seem, all my mates who were, have done great investigative journalism over the years, they were young too once, and that's how they got into it. I mean, it's... it's it's not, it isn't a mysterious force really. What it is, is, is an enthusiasm for finding out how things are and how they really are and actually caring about the world you're in. It's about thinking, why are things are as they are? Is it right? And something that really offends you, you investigate. And it's not something that you have to have done 20 or 30 years of journalism to do. It's something you can do from the first day that you start in journalism. I'd also say that I don't expect, because you're here, to assume that everybody in here wants to be an investigative journalist. Uh, I'm sure that there are people who are more interested in a much more varied group, you know, aspects of journalism. But it doesn't mean that you can't be aware 
of the significance of investigative journalism. You know, it, it is really, it is, I like to think of it as the sort of asp, one of the aspirational pivots of good journalism, that people who will uh, go out and find those difficult uh, stories. I mean, to, to return an old phrase, you know, everybody has an opinion. Opinions, you know, it's, there's no value to it. What are sacred are facts. If you can find out facts nobody else has found out or can find out, that makes you special. That means that you can contribute. You can do something at the top of your profession. And it, it comes to you in different ways. It isn't a mysterious. There isn't an investigative journalism tree out there that you pluck stories of. It often comes from actually doing quite simple, perhaps almost mundane stories that you suddenly realise have uh, a much wider uh, uh, you know, application. Ha are your little example of something really is amplifying and exemplifying a much wider malaise in society or something that needs to be addressed. So what, I, what I'm suggesting is don't be put off. What you need to do is uh, acquire the state of mind. Now, I think it's quite hard to teach curiosity. I mean, I think it's something that you've either got or you haven't got. I mean, sometimes you can trigger it. Well, occasionally people have latent curiosity, but I think a good journalist in common, there, there, are, there is uh, curiosity is at the core of their being. They, the, wherever they go, they're thinking, why is that like that? What, you know, what, is that should that be like that? You know, it, it is a, a process where everything you are questioning, it, that's your mindset and how you go about it. And I think that's invaluable for all journalists. You know, even those who want to do lifestyle journalist, journalism or the sort of what you might see as the more softer end of the business, although it can be pretty hard in other ways, um, that you should always be inquiring. And the other thing about all this is I, can, I, I, I will sound, I don't doubt as I go into my PowerPoints a bit, I might, may sound a little pompous and a bit serious, and I will tell you about my esteemed friends who have done amazing stories. But I tell you, you, they, you we can be dead serious about what we do because we believe it's important, but we are mischievous. The whole, you know, there is an element of us is that we go and find out things because it really annoys people who are manipulative, powerful, who are exploiting their power. And we get this sense of feeling that if we upset them by revealing what nasty things they're doing, it makes us feel good. And there is a, you know, all the people I know are like that. And that, well, that's what makes them great company and why I've stuck with it all these years is that I still enjoy hanging out with people that I've known in some cases since they were, four, you know, four, for 40 years in some cases. And some of them, I've, you know, um, we hope to bring in. There's a few local people, I think, particularly of someone like Nick Davis, who lives in Lewis, who is a phenomenal investigative journalist. And, and, and I think it's really good, you know, that you, you, you know, to come in and meet good journalists. And I know... And I will discuss this. There are, there are other good journalists in this room. And, you know, when I look back as how I learned, OK, all the stuff about, you know, sitting in, maybe doing your shorthand, gosh, doing shorthand, all that kind of thing, or learning media law. But hanging out with journalists to find out how they think and how they go about it is a high, it's a really good form of motivation. So, uh, you know, go and meet journalists. Talk to them. By and large, they don't bite. Um, mostly they're really pleased to see that you care enough that you want to get in this profession. That's the way most journalists are. So go and talk to them, approach them, don't be frightened of them. And you will notice that when I was talking earlier, because I sort of see, I don't see my academic side as separate from my investigative side. You know, I'm looking into things, I dig, I just happen to dig in different areas these days. But I was making the point, I think, that, you know, talk and understand how journalists think. They're not always right but some of them are right. Try and work out which ones are right, which ones are wrong. Think of it in, when you're writing your essays about, or you, if, you know, if you're the students here are writing essays, what it all means. And, 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 and talk to people, because that's where you find out. Don't just rely on your books. Go and talk to journalists. That's what I really think is, you know, and I'm surprised how rarely in the past I've encountered students. Get out there. You know, you are, you're not a student, in my view. You're an early career journalist. Right. And that was meant to be one PowerPoint. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to try and keep the rest of it shorter, because there's lots to do this evening. Now, the, 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 I thought I'd just be a bit more serious. And, and I, you know, what is an investigative journalist is a good starting point. And I tend to use this one. Um, Hugo de Berg, and I'll, I'll show you the, the cover in a moment, 
um, produced an edited book on investigative journalism, which for people in, uh, in universities is probably the best book to turn to still for what is investigative journalism, its different forms, what the issues are, and I commend it, not least of all because I have a chapter in it. Um, I'm going to really go to the simple points. These, these are just pictures of some of the things that I think in the West we think of as related to investigative journalism. And uh, it, it's, it's been there for 40 years and it, um, uh, it, you can't avoid it. It's the Watergate affair. Is I think the watershed moment of uh, investigative journalism because uh, it, it takes a lot of beating to actually, as the investigative journalist, to actually have the uh, President of the United States have to stand, stand down as a result of your investigations. And it, it stands as a pivotal moment and uh, it, it inspired a generation which included, you know, me, because when I was 20 or so, I really got sort of interested in it because I was very taken by what was going on at that time and looking at, you know, uh, there were the aspects of Watergate, but there were also investigations in the CIA and intelligence, which have always remained one of my core areas. And th this shows some of the different aspects that, you know, that one of my favourite uh, films is The Insider. I commend that. That's looking at the tobacco industry. If you want to see, you know, good films on investigative journalism, there's some of the things here that reflect um, uh, be the big events of the last 30 or 40 years. And you see the more personality-driven uh, investigative journalist. Uh, he's not so prominent these days I've uh, here, really. He's sort of slightly retired as John Pilger, very important. Michael Moore has done some very interesting things. And I, his latest I'm t uh, film on capitalism is supposed to be very good. I'm not sure that it's strictly investigative journalist because I haven't seen it, but uh, people say it's really quite an interesting thing. Oh, dear. Now look what I've done. Flick, 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 flick back. Right. Okay, in the UK, again, we have sort of a seminal moment about the same time. We've got the Sunday Times under the editor Har Harry Evans. Um, and that really sort of started, that really, I mean, investigative journalism, you know, where, where do you say something begins? But I'm just saying in modern sense, it starts with the Sunday Times. So if you were writing an essay on the investigative journalism, you would undoubtedly mention the way that Harry Evans ran the Insight team from the 60s through to the 80s, really, although the real peak period is the early 70s. And uh, the very famous uh, thing is that they did, which is almost unimaginable now, I think, in terms of the resources it took, the number of journalists, the legal action to take on um, uh, the, uh, the thalidomide, um, the pharmaceutical company who, supply, who developed and supplied thalidomide to pregnant women, women which resulted in deformities and problems for a huge number of children. Sunday Times took it on, and at that time it was hard taking on a huge institution. I mean, it still remains hard, perhaps even harder today, but it was no mean feat, and it took them years, and it took them a lot of money, and they kept going, and it, it, it put down a landmark that all subsequent investigative journalists, editors, are having their mind when they're doing difficult stories. So that, this is a, a starting point, and, and I'm starting with these things because very much what uh, we're trying to do is just, just take you through a quick historical survey. These are just some of the investigative... There's lots of great investigative journalists, uh, but these are the ones that I just thought of uh, as, the, as the prime ones. The one you probably don't know is Gunter Wallraff. He was... Um, uh, is a German uh, investigative journalist who started really the whole undercover thing. Uh, he, in Germany in the uh, 1970s, uh, there were a lot of Turkish guest workers going into the country and they were treated abysmally. Um, uh, and Walraff, who was, is, is a German national, he disguised himself as a Turkish guest worker and then he reported back on his experience. And it, it's a phenomenal piece of work, which he did off his own bat. He wasn't, as I recall, he wasn't funded. He, um, he just took himself and did it. And I've always thought he was inspirational. I've, uh, you know, I've always kept him as one of my top. Paul Ford, unfortunately, is dead, but he was very involved with the, uh, the Daily Mirror, as was Pilger, uh, in its heydays of radical, leftish, popular press um, before celebrities took over. And uh, his work for Private Eye was absolutely amazing on a huge number of stories. I'll come back to Private Eye. There's something Private Eye is doing at the moment that I think is really interesting and I don't think he's really been taken on board fully. 
I'll come back to that. Now, it's a peculiar thing, but um, with journalists, if I have often tried this when I've been talking to students coming in that I'm first meeting, and I often say, right, tell me your top three journalists that you really like. And often people have nothing, don't have any. And you think, if, well, if I was doing an English literature course and I said, uh, tell me your top three uh, writers, immediately everybody would say, oh, I love, you know, it could be Ian McEwan or it could be Thomas Hardy, it could be a whole range of things, but you'd, everybody in that room would have three people. So what's wrong with journalists is my question. Well, if you want to understand, if you're interested in an area and you want to understand how people think and work, then I, I advise you to sort of pick one that you really think is doing interesting work in your area and then watch them. You know, it's really hard. It's not really hard these days because all you have to do is put a Google alert and you put their name in and see when it pops up and then see what work they do. How do they write? How do they get their stories? You know, how do they assemble? It gives you some, something to be going on with nearly in all creative areas. People watch what the previous generation uh, to get some hits. What you do, uh, it's like if you're, you know, if you're a trumpet player, you might listen to Miles Davis. You, 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 you assume their skill and listen to how they do it. You imitate and then you find your own ways. You find your own stories and you develop them. So I really think it's a really useful thing to do is to um, adopt a journalist. You don't have to take that too literally. <laughs> but however, if anybody... <laughs> anyway. Um, Private Eye, uh, you, you, I, you know, how many people in this room read Private Eye? Well, it's peculiar because it's really not online. It's something you buy uh, in, a new, in, in, a, in a news agent and you read on the toilet because it has nice short articles, which about the time you need. For, so it's very... So, but, but the stories they are doing are absolutely amazing. I would really, they really are doing some, they, their circulation is up in, I think it's 285,000 at the moment. And, uh, and, and, it, and it's, it's just doing some really interesting things about how things really work in, in British society. And I really do commend it. What I think is really interesting at the moment is that they've been using various techniques to identify uh, who owns property in the UK? And they have been uh, getting information from all different sources and meeting resistance to establish who, you know, one of the big things that's driving the housing market in this country is, um, is foreign investment in housing, uh, which is driving the London market to ridiculous levels and clearly is going to end up in a bubble. And they are trying to demonstrate it and, and, and put, a, you know, some kind of empirical analysis to say how many people, where are they coming from, what, are, you know, who, who, where's this money coming from? And it's clearly coming, it's being laundered, is one of the clear, you know, observations you make. This is dirty money coming to the UK, it goes into the London market, because you don't have to rent a flat out in London because you know your return is going to be in excess of double figures. And it's pushing the market up. And what it's doing is it's forcing the market, is an, it market is now the housing market in this country is now, uh, as you will know, is a investment tool for a lot of people. It isn't about making sure people have how, uh, roofs over there, which I find deeply and profoundly um, offensive, that people cannot find a house or home at a reasonable price. And you will be feeling that probably a lot more than me. It's abstract to me because I've got a roof. I mean, I you may be thinking, how am I ever going to be out of a house? Well, what you're up against is uh, millionaires in Kuwait, in Russia, who are buying to leave house and property, and the private eye is on it. And they are being resisted. The land, the land registry don't like it. They're, they're trying to freedom of information. The land registry is trying to block it. They are going for it. And they've got all this stuff. Actually, this stuff is online, and I would commend you to have a look at it. But it's exciting and interesting. Now, it's not terribly sexy, but it's really important. And so I would commend that when you next walk past a place, a news agency, so you go in and buy a copy of Private Eye. Have a look in the back, because one of the peculiar things about Private Eye is it doesn't put everything on the front, because it usually has an amusing cartoon. It is satirical, after all. And a lot of the best stuff is actually in the back, which is a sort of perverse thing. But um, uh, many of you probably have seen the editor. Who knows who the editor is? In and where do we see it in? Hislop. Yeah, yeah. 
And he has, um, you know, under, under that sort of bemused, slightly vicary type personality, he has, um, he has a journalistic instinct of steel. He's a great journalistic editor. You know, he supports his reporters to do great work. So I commend it. <laughs> Uh, again, I mentioned uh, Nick Davis, Stephen Gray, Lowell. These are good ones that are working at the moment. There's lots more, and I just, I'm just giving you a hint here. And if you want to talk to me about more, I will. One of my favourites, and not everybody's, but mine, is someone I've known for over, again, since I've known him since 1982. This is Andrew Jennings, who, if you see him on TV, probably on Panorama, and you probably will do in the next month, looks like a demented gnome. <laughs> But he is one of the country's finest investigative journalists. For the last 13 years, self-financed by selling free, free work freelance and working for Panorama, he has turned over FIFA. And he is the person who has consistently gone up against Sepp Batter. And uh, he has done this relentlessly. I mean, at a level of relentlessness that I, I think I cannot think of any other journalist who has persistently pursued one story for 13 years. And that before that... He did 10 years on, um, on the uh, International Olympics Committee. And before that, we worked together uh, on police corruption uh, in the Met. Uh, that was a pretty exciting period. Uh, I remember that uh, Andrew's house was under surveillance by, uh, by the police because they didn't like him investigating Met, so they put a squad to watch him. And on one occasion, I went out filming with him where we were ambushing uh, an armed robber who we believed had a corrupt relationship for which, uh, at, the, at the peak of this exciting moment, uh, the armed robber uh, drove into my car and knocked it out of the way so he wouldn't get interviewed. Um, Andrew was really annoyed that I hadn't blocked him more f efficiently. <laughs> uh, so there you go. But um, he's working, I happen to know, on a new panorama, which is looking at Set Blatter, and um, uh, it should be uh, very amusing and tell us more about the scandal that is FIFA. One of the finest demonstrations of... The, um, how power in a, in a global scenario, in a situation overwhelms any kind of ethical, legal or moral responsibility. You know, FIFA's behaviour over the last 10 years is, is, is despicable in all sorts of different ways and they have, because they're so powerful, uh, they're so corrupt, they have been able to resist until quite recently a thorough investigation. Andrew, I feel, has been so persistent and so effective that we now, you know, we now see Coca-Cola and the sponsors demanding his removal and lots of other people. And I don't think he's going to be there a lot longer, but then we have said that before. Um, and when I'm talking about investigative journalism, I'm talking about good journalism. Uh, I, I sometimes, you know, I can do the sophisticated thing, but I really do think that it's vitally important um, and, and I think this quote from the, the former editor of CBC really sort of sums it up. There is no more important contribution that we can make to society than strong, publicly spirited investigative journalism. It is just, um, you know, the core of what, you, you know, journalism should be about, even if it's not practised by all journalists. Um, they should at least have it in their mind. And it's quite a simple thing, you know, uh, one of the things I realised, I think, fairly early on as the investigative journalist, because I didn't come from the, you know, I'm not an elite journalist. I didn't do the Oxbridge into uh, national newspapers route. Um, was that I realised that really what I was was I was uh, I was just a member of the public who had been elevated into a situation where I had the support of a news media organisation that allowed me to ask questions which. Other people wouldn't be able to ask and probably would get punched if they did, uh, but I could ask them. And that's very powerful because you realise that that gives you a moral responsibility. That's a responsibility for ordinary people. You are speaking on their behalf because they can't do it because they do not have any power. And, they, and you know, that's, that's the great thing about journalism. You can go, especially if you're supported by a vigorous news organisation and ask those questions of the people who need those questions asked. And it doesn't, you don't have to be special to do that. You just have to remember that you're a journalist and this is what you do. And you go and ask the questions that no one else is prepared to ask. Um, that gets into the complexities of what 
where the borders of investigative journalism lie. And I, I, I spoke earlier because I don't think it should be hidden under, uh, under the... We, I should, we shouldn't be... We might be embarrassed that the, the phone hacking scandal has happened and that, that there are a lot of journalists on trial over uh, paying uh, uh, public officials. I should say allegedly because some of them are still on trial. Uh, some uh, journalists are allegedly allegedly paid public officials, prison officers, police officers, all sorts of things, uh, military people, uh, to get stories. And um, that's, that's um, been profoundly embarrassing uh, for journalism, and we're going to have to get over it. The important thing it always to bear in mind, because, you know, it's always possible that you will go to a news desk where you will put, in pre put under pressure to go and get a story about a celebrity and you feel really uncomfortable about it. And the big question there is, is it in the public interest? Is this doing something worthwhile? Is it something really important that you're doing? And that, that is always, you've got to keep the moral compass. And one of the things I found, you know, working uh, around with great journalists is the strength of their moral compass. And I think particularly I, I had a partnership with um, David Lee, who ended up as the investigations editor of The Guardian. And I worked with him for 10 years. And what really impressed me about him is that in any circumstances that we were in, he always knew where the moral compass should point. And, it's, and it, that sounds obvious, but when you're in a news desk, you're... Um, you're trying to find information, you're making decisions, how, you know, because sometimes as a journalist you do illegal things to find out stuff. Well, um, sometimes you're justified, but you've got to be damn sure. And you don't do this in isolation. You know, a lot of people think journalists wander around doing things. You, you talk to your editor, you talk to the lawyers. You, when you're making those decisions, you have to think of it. But all above all, you need a moral compass. Is, is what you're doing in the public interest is it good? You know, are, is, is this for the benefit of people? You know, does it add to the, you know, the, to the inf, you know, informing people so that they can make good decisions? It's always a, quite a useful thing to think about. And um, uh, uh, David, while well, I worked with him, never, you know, time and time again, even the most complicated situations, had a dead straight line through it. And, you know, you have to keep that. The, the, when you get... One of the important things is, is that if you get corrupted, you lose your moral company. You start to fudge your decisions. You've got to keep those decisions clear. Um, the other thing I wanted to say... What's your timing like? Hmm? What's your timing like? Uh, about another three or four minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, he's got plenty of time. Right. <laughs> I timed that right, didn't I? You did. <laughs> The other thing I want to say is that, uh, I've, you know, when I started, I said, you can do this. You know, it's nothing to stop you doing it, even at an early stage. And also, uh, the other thing I wanted to bring home is it's, it's not just panorama. It's, it, you can do this journalism, you know, in, in the region you're in. You can do it in lots of different ways, and lots of journalists are doing it. And, I, you know, um, I, and I, when I started doing this, I said, well, I asked Ivor, I mean, because I don't know the area well yet. I said, you know, some examples of work. So he pointed out to me a couple of examples, uh, uh, one with the byline of Greg, and the other one I have here is uh, the rival team and looking at the stories. And um, I just want you to think about if you get a story, you know, it may seem quite st small initially, or it's a local story, it's a regional story. It doesn't have to be a panorama to get. You start with what you've got, and then you, 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 you do your work, and you, what you do is you say, OK, I think I'm onto something here, but I need advice. Now, this is the big thing. You don't know it all when you first start. You have to learn. But what there are out there are friendly journalists, particularly editors who want good stories, because for all the things that go on, one of the great things that, uh, about investigative journalism, it is one of the great sterling currencies of, of journalism. You, they, that, if you get a great piece of investigation, it's likely to go on the front page or on... It's going to be flagged on the online site. It's going to make something significant. So, you know, if you can work in that area, that's the kind of, you know, you're dealing in a sterling currency. And what I would say is that you, you approach a journalist who knows how to deal with this. And uh, the papers are here and uh, the, the news outlets here, they have experienced people in who will listen to what you have to say and they may seek to advise, advise you as to how to proceed. They may assign you to someone who's a bit more skilled, a bit more knowledgeable. 
But they're looking for stories. And if you've got one, that's a really important part of the process. So I think, you know, what you should be doing is thinking about everything you do, what story? Can I take this story? Is there something beneath it? When you think you're showing science, you don't have to have it completed. You will say, perhaps I need some advice. So you, hopefully uh, my colleagues when they, um, from the, uh, the local press, when they stand up, will um, talk a bit about what, how accessible they are to people who have a bit of enthusiasm for that. And at that point, I think um, I'll draw a line under it. Okay, I think well, Paul, thanks very much indeed. Stay there, because you wound up um, so well. We've got time for a few questions before we move to the second half, and I'll hand over to Paula. So, uh, that's a selfie. I thought that was a question. It was a selfie stick. <laughs> um, are there any questions that, that you want to ask Paul about anything he says? I've got the... Right, yeah. Off you go. Yeah, my question is, um, as someone who has a sight problem, and a hearing problem. I often get pigeonholed by editors into a box where that's all I'm allowed to work on, and which is something I don't like doing. What advice can you give me about wanting to do investigative journalism? I am naturally curious. I like going to people and going, come on, come on, tell me what you're doing. Tell me why I'm not allowed to know that. Um, does that mean I'm at least halfway there? Yeah, that, that, means, that means you are halfway there. It means that there are there are journalists, and I think particularly the BBC, who have been very, you know, have been particularly um, uh, sensible about this. They're interested in the stories you can get. They're not interested in what you, you know, what you can do physically or otherwise. They're interested in your stories, and that's the currency. And if you show that you have an ability to deliver stories, that's what matters. And uh, there are great journalists who have overcome. I mean, you know, I mean, on the more obvious way, you've got Frank Gardner at the BBC who was shot and, you know, has to move, well, he's, for a long while he was in a wheelchair, and, but he still appears on TV. There's lots of examples, and I can think of many others. Jeff Sphinx is another person that I think of. I mentioned thalidomide. He was a victim of thalidomide. He's, he was um, a great, uh, he's moved on now, but he was a great BBC journalist. So, you know, it's the stories that people are interested in, and I think, you know, you, I'm not saying that you won't find difficulties, but I'm saying is stick with the stories. I think you've got a slight advantage that you make people feel slightly defensive, or not defensive but vulnerable. I think in some ways that you, you have a certain advantage that people would not be as rude to you as they might be to other people. Uh, and, and the other thing is you turn, you turn your disadvantages to your advantage, is that you know a lot about some things that affect other people that you ha are thinking about, and where I suspect, you know, there are all sorts of issues that can be highlighted. So, you know, every good journalist has hinterlands and personal experience in which there's often that they're motivated by things that have happened to them or their friends uh, that they feel strongly about because they've had personal experience. And that you may be able to use that to your advantage. Okay, any other questions? I can now see better. Right. Okay, Ooh. look, let's move. I'm going to hand over to Paula. Our three guests, I'm going to ask you... Because we're doing lecture capture and recording it, I think it's probably the easiest for us to capture it if you actually stand at the lecture. But anyway, so, I'm uh, going to ask you, Paul, to take over and introduce Have this. you ever thought, Ivor, that lecture capture is like selfie, really, isn't it? It's it a is. sort of glorified <laughs> selfie. <laughs> <laughs> Except even fewer people probably wouldn't be. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Paul Lashmar. We're lucky to have you on the team. And I feel proud to be associated with the University of Sussex's journalism team. Um, BJW and uh, University of Sussex have so far trained hundreds of journalists so, uh, already in the last five years. And they've gone on to get MAs, they've gone on to get their NCTJ qualifications, but more importantly, they've gone on to get great jobs and they're working now at the Times, the Huffington Post, Latest TV, the Argus, all sorts of places, Red Magazine, places that you've never heard of, but places that you have as well, BBC and ITN. And so you might well be thinking, well, they have, and, and how do I get there? Hopefully you're thinking that. And obviously what the important message is that you should jolly well work very hard and you should study your shorthand. And that's obviously what I meant to be saying. That's all right. But the other thing you should be doing and the success
successful ones do is be a journalist from day one, which is what Paul said. You know, you're not students, you're trainee journalists now. And so how do you do that? You should be coming up with ideas for stories and you should be punting them out to whoever you possibly can. And you're really lucky tonight because you've got three local people who are interested in your stories. So um, if I can first introduce Mike Gilson, he's the editor of the Argus, and he's uh, going to come and I've asked all of them to talk a little bit about their careers, how they got there, what they love about being journalists, and what they want from you, how you can get your name in print or in lights in, however it, however it is. So if I can give you Mike Gilson first. Well, the first thing is to listen to the brief, because that's not what I've done. But uh, <laughs> um, So I'm sorry about that. Um, good lesson. And no PowerPoint for me because I'm an old inky, so uh, you know I don't do those sort of things. But I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Paula said, I'm the editor of the Argus now. I, I uh, came before, six years before that, I was uh, editor of the Belfast Telegraph. Um, great place where the, the story gods kept giving, um, uh, for no doubt about that. And before that, the Scotsman. And before that, on uh, regional newspapers, including in Portsmouth, and, and at the Gravesend and Dartford Reporter, or Distorter, as the, the locals <laughs> knew it. Um, so I've had a great career, all in ink, uh, all in ink and digital. Um, it's been a, a fantastic journey. I started off in hot metal. Anyone know that? Hot metal? No. <laughs> God, I feel old. Um, hot metal literally was little ingots of lead, and you put it on the page, and it, no, don't worry. So, yeah, journalism is changing, no doubt about it. Um, there are big questions for all of us in the industry, for all traditional outlets, newspapers, TV, radio, and even existing digital companies. Um, the structure of the industry is coming to change as, fund as funding models come into question. I remember when I started that uh, the, the only thing in town was how much you could put up the uh, jobs rate every year and you could watch the money flowing through the window and it was happy days. Things are different. Um, but for you, there still exists an enormous panorama opportunity if you're creative, driven, and entrepreneurial. There's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there uh, selling, telling us what the future is and what the future holds for journalism. But the truth is that actually nobody really is that sure. But what will survive, and I'm absolutely certain of this, and this comes from 30 years of, of basically, although things change, doing the same thing, um, is that... that that, that good stories will always be in demand. Companies in whatever form will need them. For beyond the current insatiable demand for clickbait and the rest of it will be the continuing age-old need to arrest attention long enough for advertisers to get response. That can only be done by publishing compelling stories through words, videos and pictures. So if you look, there's a business model pared down for the Twitter age. It is literally that. Have you got compelling content? That's the model that I have to work with. I'm not in state TV, but what I have to do is make sure that my journalism is read enough for advertisers to advertise with them, and so therefore I carry on doing the things that I love to do. And actually, that will remain the case and has been the case right from the start, however different the model changes. And so for that, what you need is, as Paul was saying earlier, you do need robustious troublemakers. So that's what we are. Absolutely no doubt. You know, I mean, I was always told if you go past a news agent's window and don't look at the notices, do they still even have notices on news agents? They do, Ivor. Thank you. That's not just you and me. They do. Um, and notice the old thing about the wedding dress for sale, no previous uh, 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 wearer, that sort of thing. And you've stopped and looked at that and thought what a good story it was. It was the same 100 years ago, and it's the same now. Can you tell a good story? Sure, you need to listen to, uh, you need to be able to celebrate achievement and tell good stories of triumph over adversity. But really also, just as Paul was saying, you need to have the people there prepared to lift the rocks to find out what's underneath. And also to listen to nutters. That's the other thing I would say, because, um, you know, they're the people often with stories. And I remember when I first started, sorry, this is going to be a bit old bugger telling stories, but you did ask Paula for us to tell the stories. Second wig I was ever in journalism. We used to have some people downstairs at the distorter. People used to come into the office, and there was always a guy called Reg Weston. Reg is in. Oh, Jesus. Reg is in. Reg was the only member of the Communist Party of Great Britain at that time, uh, and was always coming in telling us about how the running dogs of capitalism were on their last, and it was always down to the trainee to go down there and listen to him and say, yeah, Reg, that's great. That'll make a great story, Reg. Yeah, really, really good. 
And so I always had to go down and speak to Reg. But what I noticed about Reg was that actually he was beyond all the kind of uh, the imperialist lackeys and all the rest of it. He actually had a bit of an astute mind about him, him. And what I found out about him was he actually was a former night editor of the Press Association. None of my colleagues had found out anything about this. So we used to go for a couple of drinks. And two weeks later, he rang me up and said, Mike, I need to tell you there is a list coming out uh, of people that uh, the Soviets have let go because it was a breakdown of Glasnost and all the rest of it at the time. And the Simon Wiesenthal organization, which was a, a Nazi hunting organization based in California, is going to list a number of people living in Britain accused of Nazi war crimes. And I've got one for you. Now, this is Reg, who thought the Imperial's running dogs, blah, blah, blah. We're going to, well, OK, Reg, great. And it was a guy called Paul Reinhardt's. And Paul Reinhardt's was the, uh, uh, the Latvian minister for labor under the German uh, occupation and sent 20,000 people to slave camps in Germany. Many of them obviously didn't return. And there he was. There was no investigative, unfortunately, unlike Paul, there was no investigative journalism about this. His name was in the phone book. Um, I went round and I knocked on his door and he came down, massive imposing Latvian, and I asked him, are you Paul Reinhardt? <laughs> I'm Mike Gilson from the Grays and Dartford Distorter. Um, so I said reporter. Sorry, that's in the brain now. Um, <laughs> um, I've got to put it to you that you were a Nazi slave master. And that was two weeks into my journalistic career. And he said, you better come in. And I did. And that was the story that opened up. And he had a fantastic story to tell. He's accused of that. It was actually a story went on to Panorama. He was photographed going down the street. It was my story. And it was all about because I had to go and listen to Reg Weston, the Communist Party of Great Britain's only Gravesend member. So just a little bit of advice there. Sometimes the people who are the most unlikely people, the people you groan about, are the ones who get, who, uh, get the story. And that story went on. Paul Reinhardt died before he got to, uh, got to face any kind of justice. There's a lot of debate about whether you could at that age. But, and he always said he tried to protect uh, as many uh, uh, Latvians as he could because they, they'd taken over from, the, obviously, the Soviets had been in before and so on and so forth. Fascinating story for a 21-year-old to get involved in, uh, but an amazing story about listening to nutters. Um, and if you can do that, if you can listen to people, if you can get those things, if you can be a troublemaker, you will be in demand, regardless of what people are saying about the future of our industry at the moment. But you will probably need to be a far better salesman than I ever was, uh, because you will probably need to be more entrepreneurial, more pushy, more telling, and, and more prepared to just have your stories and hawk them around. Because talent will out, and we will look for it, and we will need it. I mean, you take a look at local journalism, for example. Imagine the democratic deficit that will be in existence if we weren't around. Even my rival colleagues there, I'll give them that uh, today. If we all weren't around together. In the last seven months, Paul put up an example there. We, checked, we saved the children's centres from the axe in Brighton. We told people that there were 750 crimes unreported in the last two weeks uh, uh, time. We told the story about the huge payoff to the party chief executive. And we took real robustious approach to that story in a way that the BBC didn't and perhaps couldn't. We told how six people had died because of poor treatment at the A&E in Brighton. Um, we told you that there wasn't a single train that left at 7.30 in Brighton that made it to London on time once last year. Not once, and that's absolutely true. And also, at the moment, we're all trying to push and cajole our council into trying to do something about Brighton's crumbling seafront. All really important campaigning journalist stuff that just needs the idea, just needs the passion, just needs you guys to stand up to the big guy and say, I'm the same. This, this, this relationship is level. It doesn't matter that you're earning 250000 I'm on <clears throat> living wage. I'm at your level here on this story. Um, so, send me your stories. We're interested in them. We work a lot with uh, journalism works. We've got, we had a, a guy I think I've seen here today. Ollie, were you here? Someone was here today. Who's, who's in the uh, August today? Yeah. Just going around. <laughs> Ollie's job today was to go around and see how many vending machines were in leisure centres uh, because the council of, of, of today launched a sugar smart or something, sweet smart campaign to get rid of sugar and the rest of it. Uh, in our diets. Unfortunately, every single one of their leisure centres, it will sell you Twixes. Uh, what else did you find there? Uh, every sort of sugary, fatty content treat you can imagine. Exactly. So, you know, a good piece of troublemaking journalism on a small scale, but a good story. And it certainly meant you, you had your shoe leather one out there. But So, I think 
send me stuff that I can't ignore. You know, I'm interested in good, strong local stories. I'm interested in, 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 in people and faces and, 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 you know, things that cause trouble. That's what we want to do and what we want to continue to do because it's what people notice. It's not, all, it's not all bad news, some good news as well, of course. We have to celebrate success and we have to celebrate the good things that are happening in Brighton. Give me things I don't know, though. You know, that's the difference. Tell me things I don't know, not confirm my prejudice. That's what news is about. Tell me things I don't know. And also don't presume, I'll just very quickly end you with a, with a story which I am told is true, but Paul and, and Ivan might, believe, might, might not be true. But the editor of the Daily Record said to me, and this is an absolutely true story, that a reporter of his went round uh, to, there was a story, and he went out, a training reporter went out to see a vicar in Glasgow to ask him about a burglary that had happened um, in, his, in, the, in the manse there. And the reporter went in and the vicar said, come in and uh, would you like a cup of tea? And while the vicar went to make him a cup of tea, uh, the guy on the, saw on the mantelpiece, got a good journalist, doesn't just listen. He looks and he saw everything uh, on the mantelpiece and he saw a picture of Ken Dodd, the famous old comedian. And he went, Ken Dodd, I'm, I'm still okay here. People know Ken Dodd? Hair out, buck teeth, we're okay? Right, okay, saw a picture of Ken Dodd on the mantelpiece. Um, Vicar came back and the, just to keep the conversation going, the reporter says, oh, sorry, Vicar, I, I, I didn't realise that um, you were a big f uh, friend of Doddy. The vicar's face changed completely. That, he said, is a picture of my wife. <laughs> now, I'm told that story is absolutely true. Look it up. But all I can say is th this is a very, very great career. You have lots of fun. Every day is different. And you stick with it. Flood us with stories. Don't take no for an answer. And you'll do fine. So thank you. Hello everyone. Um, firstly, thank you, Paula, for this nice opportunity. It's uh, yeah, it wasn't so long ago that I was sat that side. It's a lot nicer sat that side than sat up here. I'll still up here. I'll be honest about that. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, um, you're probably all aware of the Argus. You're probably all aware of Broughton Hove Independent. But Latest TV is a relative new kid on the block. Um, we are one of 30 local TV stations across the country. We're all independent, but we come under the banner of the local TV network. So it's an informal grouping. And Latest TV is owned locally by um, a group of, well, two madcap Brighton entrepreneurs. Uh, they're my bosses, I'm allowed to say that. They, um, Angie Marinani and Bill Smith, who launched a magazine probably about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, based on property. It's a weekly magazine. And Bill has been talking about local TV for a while. He's been badgering government ministers probably for longer than I've been alive for local TV. And um, eventually the government, um, five, six years ago, decided to make it happen. And uh, Brighton's was one of the first franchises offered and latest TV got it. And then I uh, was basically recruited to head up the news team. So um, we've been on air for just over a year. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I've lost quite a lot of hair during that time through uh, <laughs> pulling it out. But, um, yeah, it's been great. Um, and we uh, broadcast on Freeview Channel 8, version 159, and also online. We uh, Brighton and Hove, as I said, local TV station. We also extend out to Worthing. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a really fun thing to be involved in. Um, it's very, very different. I mean, my, my background was newspapers. I actually worked at the Argus um, for five, six years, which is brill. Um, really enjoyed it. A great place to learn my craft. And hopefully um, I did all right there, uh, which was good. I actually left before Mike joined. Um, but, yeah, it, that was a great place. And, and actually the one thing which I loved about local newspapers, I and mean, I, did have, I have had opportunities to move up to nationals, but the one thing I loved about local media generally was the fact that you are basically accountable to the people you live next door. You know, you have to walk out the door every day, and the people that you're next door to, if you've messed up, they'll come to you, they'll badge you and say, look, that was a load of rubbish you wrote. And you have to look at them in the eyes and say, yeah, really sorry, that was a load of rubbish. Um, and the fact is, you know, you can't hide behind these big banners. You can't hide behind, I'm a BBC reporter. You can't hide behind the fact that, you know, I work for the Sunday Times. You are ultimately, your name is known in the community. And um, 
it's quite scary. Um, there are times where you don't want to leave the house and see your neighbours, um, but there are also times where you do want to leave the house and you walk walk with your head high, held high because actually you know that you've actually done some good for it may be just a couple of people. It might be the uh, the branch secretary of the local commie party. Um, it might be you know a couple of hundred people who use a local children's centre. You know it, it, it varies, but actually knowing that you're actually doing good in your community, as daft as it sounds. Uh, was the reason why I've decided to stay local. Um, I'm going to keep it very brief because you're probably all thirsty and fancy a beer or a cup of tea or something. So just to let you know how to get involved. Um, Latest TV is a very small operation. On a daily basis, I've got two video journalists a day plus two people on sport. And out of those four people plus me plus a couple of extras, we produce a two-hour live show Monday to Friday. Uh, and we also do three evening broadcasts, so it's quite full on. Um, it's a lot of work, and I expect people to be able to do everything. So, um, yeah, basically, I'm not really all that interested in people's qualifications. I just want people with the right attitude to come in. Um, and, yeah, it's great if you're academic, but ultimately it's whether or not you can go out in the street and ask people to be stopped for an interview and just do the basics. Um, it's more about you as a person than it is for qualifications, although they do help. So I must throw that in for Paula before she gets angry at me. Um, but yeah, it's all about attitude. It's all about being out there. It's all about basically having the balls to go and ask questions, even if it's a case of asking a question of, can I come in for a week and see how you work? Um, we're a bit mad. We work out of a TV studio that's a bar during the evening. We work on green screen. We have to build the green screen set every morning. We have to pack it away every night. There are days where I come in in the morning and I've not got a desk or chair, so I have to go downstairs and lug it up the stairs myself. I'll be honest, I'm not, you know, it's, I'd rather get someone else to do it, but ultimately, you know, there's nobody else around because they're all out like, covering stories. Um, so, yeah, if you want to get involved, I've got some business cards, which you just pop next door and see me, and uh, we can have a further chat then. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And now over to Greg Hadfield from the Brighton Hope Independent. So yeah, Greg Hadfield, 59. Um, <laughs> almost the oldest person in the room, I think. <laughs> almost. Uh, and just in case you're misled, you don't have to be white, middle-aged male to be a journalist. <laughs> Sorry, Tim, you're, I know you're not middle-aged. Uh, and particularly if you see your, your role as a journalist to give a voice to the voiceless, which is what it's about, then it requires a diversity of input. And it, you don't have to be able-bodied, David. And it's, uh, it's great to see you again, David, here. And I saw you the other day, and we will do work together. I'm sure we will. And I hope you get the full support you deserve in becoming a journalist, because it is, it, it's terrible even if you're just a woman. But can you imagine... <laughs> being not white or not able-bodied or working class and all that stuff. It's very difficult. But I've never been more excited to be a journalist. It's a fant I wake up every morning more excited than I can believe. It's the best time in the world to be a journalist. Shit time to be a newspaper owner, I have to say. <laughs> and if you want to build for the future, don't just think about working for newspaper or news brand. There's lots of ways of giving voice to the voiceless and telling stories who have stories to be told without working in traditional media. And I'm not just talking BuzzFeed and Twitter and all that stuff. I was speaking to a couple of uh, people in the audience beforehand, and where was it? Tanzania, and I forget where else, but Paris, and somewhere else where some experience had been done. But I live in cities, and I love cities. I've lived in Bryant for 30 years. What Tim said is absolutely right, is that you live and breathe that environment in which you, you, you live your lives, which, which you work generally. 70% of us will be living in cities by 2050. I, I began my career on the Wakefield Express, the first newspaper, I think, to be bought by Johnston Press before they expanded. In 19, I worked there in 1979. I sold Brian Hove Independent to Johnston Press uh, three, months, three months and three days ago. I'm still really excited about the potential of individual journalists to change the world. I did ancient history at Oxford. I was strange upbringing, but it qualified me brilliantly to be a journalist, obviously. But actually, it is more about now providing a platform. It's not about a service we deliver, that we know stuff. 
we go out and find stuff and then we release it to you guys when we choose to, on our terms, at our price. It is much more of a collaborative, co-productive experience, a platform, where it's not about some really smart person doing a lot of digging and telling that story. It is, it, and it never has been, actually. Even on the Normanton edition of the Wakefield Express in 1979, in the days of landlines and bus services and no Twitter and no mobile and no internet, it was always about picking up scraps of paper with stuff scribbled on, etc. But it's far easier now, because you can keep an overview of what's happening in your community, in your own office, in your own bunker, but actually it's even better if you walk around the city and you can literally find five or six things worth saying simply by moving around above ground in the real world. So how do you become a journalist? Well, first of all, what I did was I read George Orwell from beginning to end in chronological order. That is still the best way of becoming a journalist for the 21st century. We talk about data journalism. I talk a lot about data journalism. George Orwell went around and found out the rents of miners, the salaries of miners, the earnings of miners, the, the, the nature of Wigan or Barnsley, where I come from. And he collated it all and he told the story using the data. The first edition of The Guardian had education performance data on its back page. Data is really important. You guys know that. But data is only the beginning of a story because what you're trying to do is provide a platform for other people's stories and then you bolster that with the overview. So how do you do this? Well, yes, you get your byline in a newspaper. That's really cool. That's great. When I got Angry Mums Demand Pelican Crossing, shows that I don't think we have Pelican Crossings anymore. Angry Mums Demand Pelican Crossing in 1979, page lead on the Wakefield Express. God, I knew I was a journalist then. Yeah? And sure, there's a whole lot of stuff that is angry mums demanding Pelican Crossing, white man gets promotion, uh, working class youth gets sent to prison, there's traffic on the A27, there's traffic on the A23, it's sunny today, it's raining today, um, women raise money for charity, men receive checks for charity, all that sort of stuff goes on, that's journalism. There's investigative journalism, absolutely there is, and the work that... Lashman Lee did, inspired me, I was just looking, 30th anniversary, 1985, the idea of the secret state, MI6, weeding out people and identifying people who might be a risk to national security. Couldn't happen these days, obviously. Um, and there are some people who say there are no big stories to be told. There's no all the president's men anymore. You know, it just can't happen. And then WikiLeaks come, comes along, or Snowden comes along. Of course there are, it's just... It's lazy journalism and attitude to think there are no big stories. It's a bit like saying everything's fine now, democracy's won, and we don't work, need to worry about homelessness or poor pay or people getting killed in their workplace, all the George Orwell stuff. Well, of course there is. So I get a lot of young journalists, and I love working with young journalists, wannabe journalists. And it's about mindset, but actually I don't often have enough time, to be honest. And a lot of them say, homelessness, I want to do a feature on homelessness, yeah? I'm sure a lot of people want to do a feature on homelessness. All I say to people is it's got to be down and out in London and Paris. It's not just about, hey, I thought I'd sleep in a doorway for a night, which, by the way, in two weeks' time, I'm sure we'll see, because it's Cardboard City night or something. So by all means, do that, but be, try and be more ambitious, more creative and more innovative. What's my advice? Well, always get in touch. Follow me on Twitter, at Greg Hadfield. That often gets me in trouble when I speak in public events without permission of my bosses um, about journalism, but at Greg Hadfield. And I love inspiring and talking to people and learning from them and hearing what this generation is going to create for the future, because the internet has changed everything. I was the first Fleet Street journal, I was Wakeful Express, Western Morning News, big break in Fleet Street, which obviously wasn't Fleet Street, it was Vauxhall Bridge Road on today, Sunday Times, fell out with Andrew Neil. Reinvented myself as a senior investigative journalist on the Daily Mail. <coughs> and I wondered, George Orwell. I came, into the, I came into journalism to change the world, to write that 4,000-word Guardian article that would change the world. Because it's not enough, as some fantastic Marxist said, it's not enough to describe the world. It's, the goal is to change it, and that's the role of journalism. 
So when my son at the age of 12 created the world's most popular football website in 94-95, and it sold in, to, in 1999 for $40 million, and the people at the Daily Mail said, who on earth will ever get their football scores, their sports results off a computer? When we've got CFAX and Teletext, and how can you put football reports up on this internet thing, it was pre-web, but web came afterwards, on a Saturday evening, who's going to buy the mail on Sunday? But it's the 12-year-olds and the 14-year-olds and the 16-year-olds and the 20-year-olds, not the 59-year-olds or 50-year-olds or the 60-year-olds, who are going to decide and test whether it's true what the future of journalism is. And that future of journalism comes from your experience. It comes from your experience of the media that's flung at you, that you experience, and it comes from your lives in the world. And you might decide that the best place for a journalist is working for an NGO in Syria. I think that'd be great, actually. I mean, I, I got friends who, who, um, who work for Christian Aid, and they have bigger budgets and bigger platforms and bigger audiences <coughs> than The Guardian could provide or any other news media outfit. There are big media. I'm a Man United fan. I can confess that, even though it's a bad result. I'm a Man United fan, but if you're a sports reporter, it's probably good to work for Man United. I think that's pretty cool, because their fan base is bigger than the economies of many small countries. So can you imagine working as a sports journalist for a media and it's a football club or the Albion or whatever? So there's all sorts of opportunities. Now, you could also do the thing that a 12-year-old Tom Hadfield did, and think, sod all that, I'm not going to work for anybody at all. I'm just going to create my own thing. You might want to set up, and don't tell Johnston Press on NewsQuest, you might want to set up your own print publication with a digital out, um, offering in Brighton and Hove that does something really interesting about news in Brighton and Hove. Because a city of 300,000 people with a daily newspaper that has... 4,000, 5,000 copies per issue sold in Brighton, or Brighton and Hove Independent that distributes 4,000 copies per issue every week, that city cannot live, cannot exercise democratic responsibility, cannot be answerable to the citizens on that sort of fragmented, sorry, latest TV as well, uh, Tim, sorry, uh, cannot live on that fragmented media platform. There are plenty of gaps in the market for bright young men and women to do something remarkable. And it's never been easier. You can find out company's house information without going to company's house and looking at a microfiche and taking notes. You can just go to Judil or even the beta version of gov.uk. You can find out who owns what houses and properties without having a land register. You can buy the wills of various people immediately. You can Google it. Someone tweeted after one of our articles, um, it's not journalism, it's only Google. Well, to a degree, yes, Google does help. I mean, but it's never been easier. So what's stopping us? What restricts us? What restricts us is our own mindset, our own mentality that somehow we are the givers and the readers are the recipients. I don't believe that to be true. We're not some magic circle. Now, I'm not talking about citizen journalism here because actually to go to the high court to go to a uh, magistrate's court or to go to a council or to go to a health service meeting or whatever, you have to be pretty damn smart and clued up. But then if you want to know about homelessness and housing in Brighton and Hove, Andy Winter is the person who will at least guide you into that information. More importantly, if a city is a network of networks, as I believe, then by connecting to the nodes in those networks, whether it's a third sector organization or whether it's a football club or whether it's a company, then immediately your work can be disseminated through those networks. That's the six degrees effect that powered Facebook and all that stuff and Twitter and whatever. So in other words, you don't, first of all, spend 10 million pounds on a printing press and then use it when you wish to and publish all that. You've actually got all these outlets where you can tell stories and communicate and, and change the world. So where's the money? I don't know. Yeah? <laughs> I sold my paper three months and three days ago, so I d and it's profitable. So I don't need to worry about that. But actually, I didn't worry about it when I became a journalist. When I became a journalist, 
I just wanted to do journalism. And I would do it. And in those days, on an electronic typewriter, because I was quite advanced, cutting out typewritten columns, sticking them on uh, A4 paper, photocopying them, and sell selling Wakefield issues, it was a trade union, trades council paper, for 15 pence per issue, that got the story out that my own paper, Wakefield Express, would never publish. The other thing I'd say is you have to have a passion, an opinion, and an attitude. If you, if you really care about your community, you have to first of all be open and transparent about those emotions. You don't, you don't build that fence and sit on it. Yeah? That, that's not what drives traffic. You've got to be open about it, but you don't just build that fence and sit on it. You have to have a feeling, the rights and wrongs of the city, but then you have to be open enough to accept that you're not the only voice. It's a multiplicity of voices. And you've got to have that open platform. So you might agree with politician A or business person B or lobbyist C, whatever happens. But when someone says, it's not just about a right of reply, it's about a right of access. In your mind, in your, in your mental attitude, you've got to accept your byline, you as an individual, isn't even as a giver or even as a servant. It's as a participant and a collaborator. That requires social skills. That requires an understanding of technology. It does require good English and good law and, and knowledge and, and all that stuff. But it's never been easier to acquire all that stuff. And it does require working eight days a week. And it requires accepting that you're not going to be very wealthy. But what you can do is know that you are changing the world, hopefully for the better. And I say that as someone who worked for the Daily Mail. <laughs> I, love, I love Brian and Hove Independent, which has two journalists. My colleague Bex Bastable, who joined three, three months and two days ago. <laughs> um, is now, there's now two of us producing a 56-page paper, hopefully that is open to the city, hopefully with lots of picture bylines and pull quotes and everything else, um, picture bylines of voices who have something to say that is of interest that takes part in the conversation. We used to say the Times was the nation having a conversation with itself. Brian Hove Independent and one hopes all the other media in the city is the city having a conversation with itself about what sort of city we want to be and how can we get there. I think I've had enough, but I'll be in the bar anyway. Survival as the Argus is, is one of the best things that happened in media in the city since I've lived here 1986-87. Because we've got a proper journalist, a good editor with experience who can inspire some fantastically talented young journalists. And I think that showed through every single day. I will pat myself on the back and say, I think NewsQuest probably quite rightly made that decision because the Brian Hope Independent and maybe Latest TV existed the competition in the marketplace. But it's definitely not the end of the story. But if, if there is stuff, I love being in rooms with journalists, even when I'm on the Mail and they're on the Guardian, or I'm on the Sunday Times and they're on the Mail on Sunday. The competition is a friendly a competition where, yes, we all like to show off about our biomass, our scoops, etc. But where genuinely, real journalists, i.e. not people in suits up above, don't tweet them. Real journalists, <laughs> are definitely in it to make the world a better place. 
And I think that's why the more Mike Gilson's, the more Greg Hadfield's Bex Basketball's, Tim Ridgeway are in the city, the more titles, the more journalism moves in the city, the better the city will be. Unlike politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Mike. Uh, not really. I think that uh, covers all the bases. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that we want in this city is a, you know, is a multiple of voices, multiple of outlets. I think it would be a sad day indeed if we just relied on the BBC, uh, my, my beloved BBC. Um, uh, and I think that would be a, a shame. I think, you know, commercial TV is, is struggling in its own way. So I think there's many people that we can fund <coughs> to do the things that I talked about in terms of going out and causing trouble, not walking past them. Um, news agents' doors, talking to communists, the better. The, the, the other way is, is why not? Let's have as many as you can.
Actually, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I think that's a great question because I, having lived here 30 years, I, I, I feel as I know the city. My daughter lives here, my grandchildren live here. I'm not going to move. So I'm invested in the city intellectually and emotionally in all sorts of ways. But then I did rethink where, you know, especially I've had a check of, I've got a great career now. So I could write stories about migrants, this and its horror, and there's bird flu, and there's crime everywhere, and there's rapes, and there's murders, and it's you have to be really scared or at least really angry. Yeah? But that doesn't work at a local level because we know it's not true. We know that Brighton isn't so full of crime that we dare go out of our houses, but that's not to diminish the fact that women are beaten up in West Street every Saturday night. Or whatever, yeah? But it also goes to another thing that I thought about is. Yeah, HR Mountain, yeah. a relationship of journalists to politician, Dr. Lampers. <coughs> well, I don't think we should piss on our politicians. I think we should work with our politicians and public institutions and people wanting to do well in a creative, collaborative way, critical friend as mine says, where we can point out some of the shortcomings in a critical and constructive way. But actually, you've got to be optimistic to be a journalist, haven't you? Because otherwise, the world's always the same, everyone's always the same, nobody can do anything, I'm not going to vote, I'm not going to engage with society, I'm just going to, well, I don't know, I'm just going to die and read the Daily Mail. Or even read the Daily Mail and vote. That's the no. <laughs> <laughs> right, the Telegraph's case, both at the same time. Um, but no, you've got to be optimistic. So you've got to think of a way of changing the world, and you don't just do that by shouting from the sidelines pretty quickly. But you don't buy into the it's easy to make sales or grab attention by scaring doom and gloom. And it is about truth. And we can talk about truth after a couple of pints rather than a lecture stage. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what does a good day one look like on an investigation report? <laughs> a good day one. What you mean, first day you do one? Yeah. I mean, I'll, the first day of the private <laughs> Where, what's a good beginning? What do you do? I've never thought of it in that. I mean, often it's, it's it could be the you, you're having a conversation with the communist that everybody thinks is mad, and suddenly he says something and you think, oh, it's something the light goes on. Because uh, stories come in different ways, don't they? I mean, you know, it could be that you're just, um, you know, you're sitting on the news desk one day, you're doing a standard report, and you think, I wonder if this is going on elsewhere. Yeah. And, and and that's the point. Always asking the question. Is, is, is it a one-off or is it the start of the trend? The start of the trend is always good for the journalists. We like to surf the zeitgeist. We like to be ahead of the curve. You know, it's, it's got a nice surfing analogy there. And uh, <clears throat> so you're always looking for those kind of moments. You're just thinking, can this go further? And a lot of the stuff that you see in papers, um, uh, and I was taught this by my first mentor, who was, uh, had been um, a news editor of the Daily Mail. Because how I learned it was that after a heavy night's drinking, he would come back and sleep on my sofa. And I'd be lying in bed with a, with a terrible hangover, because he had greater capacity than mine. And, then, and he'd go off to the news agency at 6.30 in the morning, come back, there'd be a lot of rustling in newspapers, and they'd be tearing the newspapers. And so I eventually get up when he was getting really grumpy that I, we hadn't gone into the office. And then when I get in the office, he would slap these bits of paper in front of me. And he was effectively saying, well, there's a story here, there'd be a small paragraph. He'd say to me, find out what's really going on here. Why, what's this about? It's, it's, this can't, there must be a story behind this. Go and find out. And so I learned from him to think like, it's the state of mind. It's hanging out with journalists that know what they're doing. You, you get the sense, you're a, it's an immersive process, you begin to, you you get to a point where you'd be embarrassed not to think, what's the story behind that? Once you've learned it, you, you, if you miss it, you know, you think, how did I miss that? You know, and you feel like, you know, you've really failed yourself. So it's that process. So does that answer your question? Yeah. It's when you, it's when you see two dots and you make a line <coughs> because it's about joining the dots. Okay? And then suddenly you realise there's lots of dots all over and you see a pattern. That's the story. I was Western Morning News in the days when Press Association used to come in paper, and the news editor would rip off two lines. Ken McGinley is coming to Plymouth to discuss British nuclear tests on Christmas Island in the 1950s. 
when we send thousands and thousands of men to stand a mile away from nuclear bombs going off with no protection. And in 1980, 1979, 1980, 1981, came to Plymouth, and six, seven of us sat in a house, and that was the first meeting when five or six people said, I was there. I was on HMS Diana, I was on this. I suddenly realised, I was young, I was enthusiastic, Western Monnier was covered Devon and Cornwall, while well, hundreds and thousands of retired uh, armed services, particularly Navy, Navy people, were living. So I thought, well, I'll meet these five or six, and they'll know five or six. Very quickly, well, not very quickly, because I was driving, there was no internet, and I was using brown envelopes. I had 600 brown envelopes with 600 stories in them, and they all had photographs of being, the MOD denied that this happened, and they all had photographs of HMS Diana a mile from Christmas Island. And we did all that, and uh, the BBC Newsnight, uh, 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 Sue Lloyd Roberts, um, Trimmer from the Mirror. We were all going on about the MOD still hasn't admitted that fact. And then when you went and met them, driving to Cornwall, to Truro, to Foy, to Exeter, and they said, and by the way, my child's disabled. Oh, my child died of childhood cancer. And then suddenly, not only are you joining dots, you're discovering new dots and think, is this a pattern? Well, no, it's not. It's all right. Government scientists said it was a coincidence. And still we don't know where it's true. And the failure of journalism is in the end, you can be as powerful as you like about A, B, and C stories. But in the end, you need some help from the state politicians to change the world as well. And that's why Harold Evans and Sir Lindmark are so brilliant. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Is Peter Frey, I'm Peter Frey here. <laughs> and Pete, come on, tell us, what's the story? <laughs> oh, is this a censored copy? Yeah, well. Is this a censored copy? Yeah, that's a censored copy. Our original story was Vice Chairman. Chancellor steps down after being uh, sued by a criminal student. Okay. And is that, so you've had some trouble with that, have you said? Yeah, 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 we have. I mean, the students are not very happy about it. Is it, is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is that he, he's, being, well, he's being sued by a criminal student, that's true. Yeah. And um, you're making that to be a position to stand down? Yes, yeah. And we've been told that that's not legally okay. Okay. Although, <laughs> I, I, well, that isn't, that isn't the initial reason we were talking about that before. We didn't talk about the several was reason why we can't report the story. But, um, so tell me what you're about that. Has it put you off or are you? Um, it's been okay. I mean, I, put, I set up a website, SussexIndependent.com, and I just put essentially the story up on there. And we got sort of six or seven hundred hits, which is pretty good for, for the badger. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, we got, I'm a little bit, I've had the sort of adrenaline kick out a little bit because I sort of got the story out. And um, I'm not so worried about that. But yeah, it's an ongoing situation with senior media. Keep trucking on. Nice life, nice Keep going. Don't give up. Okay, so I'm going to still yeah. water a yeah. bottle. Yeah. 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 The story will <laughs> end. Sorry, you're about in the air. Is it? 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 Is